Yes, there's nothing wrong with your uh, YouTube set. We control the volume. We control the video. Welcome again to To the Outer Limits. I'm John Suntris along with uh, my co-host for the evening. Here's Gabe Hardman. How you doing, Gabe? I'm good. Thank you, John. And uh, our returning champion, uh, two weeks in a row, and I'm glad that he's joining us tonight. It's Jeff Parker. Good to see hey, you, Jeff. Guys. Thank you for having me on again. All right, Thank you. No, you, it's an open invitation, uh, Jeff. You proved your medal uh, last week when we were talking about the six finger, and uh, today it's uh, all about episode six, the man, uh, the man who was never born. Right? Isn't that the right title? Martin That's Landau. correct. Great cast, Martin Landau, Shirley Knight. Yeah, hell yeah. I mean, and uh, I mean, this is you know, I mean, I've, I've said this a couple times, but like, this is one of my favorite episodes. This really is one of the best episodes of this show. That sounds great. Yeah, and I mean, all the things come together, but it's it's also just a really kind of, you know, I, it has this kind of lyrical fairy tale quality at the same time as being a, a you know. A, you know, having the sci-fi patina, but very much being a sort of emotional story that's about these, you know, people and big stake, but it's all about personal stuff. It's That's exactly the kind of thing that I love. Yeah, it, it kind of handles everything, and it feels effortless. It's it's very impressive. If you did yeah. It. Uh, yes, Clay. Yeah, Andy, so, uh, Andy Parks couldn't join us because he's uh, celebrating a uh, Kansas City Chiefs victory, which I can appreciate, so... Yeah, right. football apparently football won out over that. We can appreciate that's football, that's right? That's all right. Um, the but uh, yeah. So um, just Jeff, what, what were your, what are your big thoughts about uh, this one? First, I just want to point out, in honor of the show, I brought an oscilloscope. I know. Wow. It. So I can control the horizontal. <laughs> if you see, <laughs> whoa! I lost the signal there. Hold on, I'm going to see. And. Video. And the vertical. Wait, hey, I'm not controlling the. Ver oh wait, I'm on the wrong one. No, I totally control the vertical. <laughs> this would completely be impressive if I were testing uh, an amplifier right now. Yeah, or you know, if you were talking to some sort of galaxy being. Yeah, I did. This or is exactly if... the thing you see in the background of half the episodes. Yeah, so... you're almost Truman Bradley at the beginning of uh, Mystery. Uh, what's it called? Mystery. Was it called science science fiction theater? Yes, I, they one of the precursors oh, to yeah. the outer limits. In the future, <laughs> such devices will be common household appliances. We're not sure why every every yeah. mother needs an oscilloscope, but why not? So, but oscilloscope. Everyone will be constantly probing tubes. <laughs> That's what they'll be doing. But uh, yeah, okay. So maybe we should do a traditional. Set the because assuming some people watching did not see the episode, yes, indeed, we can, uh, or we just can... can't remember exactly what this one was. Yeah, yeah, it, I... it, it opens with uh, an astronaut named Reardon, uh, and it's a beautiful shot because this this cinematography is by Conrad Hall, indeed. Yes, thank you, and uh. So you see that little uh, spaceship gliding across the uh, uh, the horizon of Earth, and it's just so gorgeous. And then there's a beautiful shot inside the cabin, and I meant to do all these little stills and send them to you, and I didn't. Uh, That's right. I got a couple stills. Like, there is Reardon and uh, Mark yeah. Landau. Andro. Andro. And uh, so anyway, that's Reardon. And the way he comes off is, you know, you see this – heroic astronaut type so you assume this show is about him right uh which is a great setup and he lands on a a, a desolate choked orange probably an orange sky uh, <laughs> world and it starts feeling extremely familiar for me and hardman yes and, uh yeah sorry guys yeah, geez. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, we are on the west coast by the way in the year 2020 um and uh, the, while he's looking around on this empty planet, my favorite detail is he's walking around with just a normal pistol. Like, right. He doesn't have a ray gun or anything. He's like, eh, 
This 38 right. got to do it. Because he's from 1964, right? Like, yeah. uh, uh, you know, they didn't have ray guns. They had, they sort of had spaceships, but they didn't have ray guns. It's, it's, it's naturalism. Right. Early Mercury, absolutely, man. Like, this this, this, this always worked for me back on the planet. You got to do it now. <laughs> It's a good thing that thing didn't go off during yeah. his trip, though. I mean, yeah, really, in the in the uh, pressurized cabin, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Hopefully, he didn't load it until he got down to the planet, and then that, that's when you meet Andro, who comes out, and John just showed his face. It's great makeup. Yes, there you go. There's a shot of Andro. That. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really it is because. And maybe because I know it's Lando, but it really, I mean, there is a hint of Lando in that makeup. Yeah, they did the hair. To... Yeah. I mean, they made it it's sort of like last week with the with that big appliance makeup. They, you know, they left room for the actor to act and for, for him to, you know, be able to express himself through that. Yeah. Yeah, like you can see his teeth really well, which for some reason I was extremely impressed by. <laughs> um, and and uh, anyway, he comes up and... Uh, you know, you don't know what to make of Andro at first, you know, and, and they have a good exchange at first where the, the astronaut asks him what planet I'm on. And he says, Earth. And for a minute, the astronaut looks confused. You know, and you think, oh, we're, we're somewhere else. Right. And, and then he reveals the classic Planet of the Apes uh, uh, discovery. You know, it's like, no, I'm from Earth and this is not what Earth's like. Earth's cool and this yeah. is horrible. And it, it's it's the Planet of the Apes uh, thing. If in the first three minutes of Planet of the Apes, they just said, "Oh yeah, there's the Statue of Liberty over there," they're like, <laughs> "We've got an hour. <laughs> we don't have a lot of time. We're oh, right we, got, we got other places to go in this story." So Andrew walks and takes him in and shows him essentially like some hall of records in a cave. Which is like, oh, we we read all the great works of literature and think how great it must have been to be in your time before we became like this. And uh, and there's barely any of us and we can't replicate ourselves and blah, blah, blah. And they do a beautiful mat shot that I just texted to you. Yeah, I'm Can sorry, you but I didn't have a chance. I'll, I'll try and put it up. But uh, yeah, it was, it was very nice. Uh, yeah, I just love it. And he's just looking. It's just a little the, long the shot. And they do the classic stage thing of walking almost into it yeah in the first and, perspective yeah, yeah yeah and stopping uh before it and, and that's when andrew reveals like uh yeah mankind was headed to the stars doing everything right and then this bertram cabot jr developed a developed something that wiped us all out and when he tells him what it is he immediately assumes nukes yeah. And, uh, and it's like, and that's how you look like it is. And you can really get from all these first episodes how the uh, the, the specter of you know, nuclear Armageddon is just weighing on people. Yeah. it's it, it, We're constantly seeing mutants and things uh, related to it. And uh, and then he says, no, it was, a, it was a microbe. I think he says a microbe. I think he does. And, and uh, he says, there was no war. You know, like, I love that. Like, it's, it, it you know, just yeah. the way that that, uh, it, it feels like, you know, going into this completely, uh, obviously apocalyptic world with these mutant people and stuff and all the things that you kind of expect out of nuclear Armageddon. But, but no, it's like, it wasn't even that, you know, it was just some, you know, uh, this, this irresponsible, uh, you know, Bertram Cabot Jr. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and again, it hits too close to home when he talks about it, essentially, being a virus that wipes out yeah. humanity, yes. you're like, all right, the outer limits, we're getting it. <laughs> yeah, they, they're, it's a, it's a little you're too really much. bringing it. Yeah, <laughs> right now, <laughs> maybe it wasn't on the nose in 1964, but it kind of or 63, but it is now. This is this is why I figured you wanted to do this whole podcast. You're like nothing speaks to our time. Yeah, no, I mean, I think though, really, like you, as you go through this thing over and over again, stuff is pretty relatable, you know, and you know, pretty like, I mean, you know, if if you made it, if you wrote it now, you would go, well, we're not going to do that because it's just let's, we're living through that. Yeah. Well, it's like the, the debate everybody I see is having. Uh, about well, like okay, if, if our thing gets greenlit and we go to do, 
Do we have people wearing masks? Mm -hmm. Do we include the pandemic? Right. And you, you can tell that's people being hope, uh, like Hollywood people being hopeful, like it's going to be over soon though. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, this will be like, we're just referencing uh, something that was a passing uh, uh, yeah. uh, old town road or something. Yeah. Like, or, like, you know, we can't talk about this. Yeah. You can't have them playing with pogs. That'll, <laughs> that'll date it. Uh, like, when, when in fact, it's kind of, it's going to be kind of weird if they don't, have anything like yeah, we're, no, we're just ignoring this massive thing that happened to the planet? Yeah, I vote no mess myself, but that's me. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't I don't think that it's depends. I, yeah, I think well, it'll yeah. just, I think that it, both directions you can end up with something that seems awkward and dated. Yeah. You know, I mean, I love right, you. who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, um, well, and um, and uh, again, so so back to the story, they uh. They they decide that uh, they could possibly go back, and and change things. And in that classic, should we kill baby Hitler so yeah. to avoid to yeah. avoid World War Two? I love that and they in, get to a baby Hitler thing right away. They get, yeah. they get everything. Yeah, Napoleon, Hitler, and I forget the third because of course sci fi. It's always got to be three. And yeah. it wasn't like Napoleon Hitler and Ulan of Rigel Seven, you know, like the right. Star well, Trek yeah, because there wasn't any Ulan of Rigel Seven because everything everything got fucked twenty years after uh, in nineteen eighty four, apparently, or eighty seven or something like that. They say, you know, uh, that he would have been young when you. I don't know. Maybe maybe my my time. Right. But and then he says, well, I even remember his mother, and uh, and that and that's of course Shirley uh, Knight. Shirley yes. Knight. Yep. And and the thing is like you know, she birthed the destroyer. Yeah, there she is. Yep. Uh, <laughs> you know, they they've all just talked about this guy forever. Yeah, I do love that they that they just obsess about the guy who destroyed the world and never get over it. Right, like they're like to the point where it's you know, it's a thousand years in the future. Yeah. Two hundred, two hundred years. Two hundred years. Yeah, that's right. That's and right. they that actually they, feels kind of right to me. Oh yeah. And they, and they spend their time obsessing about this guy and reading Anna Karenina, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, the, 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 he and the and it's a very Star Trek-y moment too, where he and the astronaut Reardon kind of get into a, their little rap battle of quoting uh, their favorite uh, bits from. I think he, uh, Melville comes up yeah. with the astronaut right. maybe or something like that. Yep. It's like, yeah. good, I'm glad. It's like, God, we got literate astronauts just out yeah. there. <laughs> right. you know, Andrew takes great. care of his books better than uh, the uh, the time machine uh, yeah. Uh, future yeah, people right. do that, you know, the books all crumble to dust. Right. But uh, isn't it great that. how every single character in this is smart and, uh, and, and aware and thoughtful and they're, but they're all sort of but they're all different and they're all coming at it from different points of view. I sure. think that's pretty great. And yeah. an unlikely thing for where, you know, you could, you could set up a, a really obvious conflict, but, you know, but it doesn't, I mean, it, it, there are, it's filled with conflicts and yet they're not like, uh, it's not just here's the stupid evil guy versus the enlightened guy or lady or whatever, you know, I mean, well, it's that's nice, you know, they're all kind of, working at odds but you know but they they're coming at it you know they're but they're all smart and thoughtful people too yeah even the astronaut yeah the, the astronaut's great he i mean he kind of does his classic uh 50s early 60s like well we got to change this let's go right. you know they <laughs> come on you're coming with me they'll never believe me just stay in this right and, and they go back up looking for the time rift a nice easy little thing where the the rocket just kind of goes through a little blank space. Yeah. And you get some effects and, uh, and he's having time convulsions. Yeah. He starts to go, I don't think I'm making it through. It, it doesn't really explain why. No. And you don't, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't. Yeah. The initial, uh, fade out. Yeah. Doesn't it makes sense. Carl held is your uh, actor. Who yes. Plays Reardon. He, I believe he was in an episode of star Trek. He was, I'm looking yeah. now. Yeah. It's uh, the return of the, Acrons, is that what it's called? Oh, the, oh yeah, Archons. You know, the one with Archons, the the one with the um, uh, where they're they're all a bunch of like pilgrims, and then but they're they're uh, you know, world is run by Landru, the uh, the computer. Yeah, and they all go crazy like at noon every day or whatever. Yeah, yeah, 
He did Sea Hunt as well. The Rebel, fine show. Mm. Uh, several Perry Masons, where he played a recurring character. Oh, David wow. Gideon. I never heard of David Gideon. I'm oh, gonna have I don't to, remember that. Yeah, I know. I'm going to have to brush up 77 Sunset Strip, Hawaiian Eye, uh, so, Craft yeah. Suspense Theater. Good so, when they, like, you know, I mean, I see, you know, in, in, in the commentary about this stuff, there's a lot of talk about how it doesn't make sense exactly that he, you know, that he vanishes or how does Andro know how to fly the ship and all, all this sort of stuff. And I just like, you know, I don't give a fuck. You know, like yeah, it really yeah. doesn't matter to me at all. Also, you're like, oh, I'm putting it on autopilot right before that. So yeah. autopilot got him back there. Big deal. Yeah, you can fill that stuff in, and, and bring. Let's bring that up again at the end because it actually does work by the little time travel rules that they establish. Yeah, in this, why he vanishes. But uh, we should have known from the title, the man who had never, who was never born. I mean, well, that's, yeah. You know, I, I forgot. You know, yeah, I the, well, the lion it. could be the man who's never born in this in this scenario, though, because you know it's right. It, it's Martin Landau, and it's the you know um, the biologist he's trying to kill. Yeah, yeah, the junior. Yeah, junior, exactly. Yes, yeah. but uh, he does go back, and he goes back to 1963. Um, he is able to mass hypnotize people around him to make him look uh, like Martin Landau. Yeah. So there's that. He's got that going for him. Or here is a better. Uh... And that that's one thing where I think that that I think is kind of great. Where uh, so like I read the script for this too, and it was the script. It was the uh, I can go into it more after we're you know, kind of get through the thing. But like the the version of the script that I have is kind of a pre rewrite version. So there's it's you know it's not dramatically different, but there are there are differences in it. And uh, and one of the things it's not so much a difference, but it uh, but. Uh, the initial way that he's described uh, in, in the script when, you know, when he's projecting the, you know, the, the human illusion is as this sort of, you know, God walks among us beatific sort of character. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, I, and I think that casting Martin Landau who, you know, I'm not saying Martin Landau is not a good looking guy, but he's an eccentric you know, he's eccentric casting for what this was set up as in the, with the kind of uh, the beauty and the beast feel to it, you know, and like and the fact that they went in a more interesting character actor, -y, you know, uh, eccentric direction is so much of what makes this so much cooler than if. Uh, Mr. You know, Perfect, yeah, yeah. Constantine or what, whatever, you know, the other right. actor that played the Martin Landau part or the, you know, uh, or some, you know, John Gavin type, uh, you know, wooden uh, uh, pretty boy. Totally. I, I feel like that's because who radiates alien more than Martin Landau? No yeah. one. Yeah. He, well, he, was also, original, he was the original choice for Spock. That's true, but also super charismatic, you know, and just yeah. like somebody who reads on camera like nobody's business. And so he can read through the makeup and he can also play that part without it. You know? And Fun. I love Feast or Famine in his career. Martin Landau was always in sci-fi, always a friend of sci-fi projects. I mean, yeah, really. And I know that he was interested in this script. It wasn't just like he showed up and they handed it to him. They, you know, Stefan read it to him. He read it and he was like, well, shit, this is something that I could, um, you know, uh, that, that could really be a showcase for me. And apparently he took an ad out in the trades the night that this was going to run saying, hey, look at my performance in this. <laughs> uh, That's cool. Out of the outer limits. I mean, people used to do that back then, you know, uh, but like, it was kind of a, a regular thing where you would, you know, Pay, for, you know, pay variety for out yeah. of a reporter or variety just to point out so that people you'll get attention from casting directors. Totally, no, well, absolutely. I, I feel like we'd be really remiss to not mention the fact that Martin Landau, before this, before he gets into acting and is in North by Northwest as Leonard, the most memorable, uh, just supporting role of all. Yeah, yeah. he was a cartoonist, he was. He, who drew yeah, comedy? Gabe was. Was sent me the Sunday, yeah. one of his Sunday strips. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I don't probably I, you know, didn't manage to get it to put it up here. But the um, the uh, yeah, apparently he was he had interned or he was sort of an assistant at, when starting when he was seventeen years old uh, at the Daily News in New York, and he would uh, and for 
a while, at least as he says it, he uh, he assisted a couple of different cartoonists and then ultimately ended up uh, ghosting uh, a strip called The Gumps, the Sunday, he ghosting the Sunday version of it, or the Sunday edition of it, and uh, for like a year, according to him. And then uh, he was, uh, and then he was kind of set to take over. Uh, he was doing theater caricatures. You know, it's in New York, so you go to, and you know, you get free tickets to the show, and you go there, and you see it, and you do care. You know, who do a caricature of the actors in the in you know new shows that open. And he was kind of set to take over that uh, regular spot, and he said it paid good, and it was a pretty easy job. But he was dying to act, and so he he knew that if he really took over that job he that's all he would do sure and he, he was he, right you know and then you know and then he wouldn't have the ambition to go on to be martin lando yeah and that's uh amazing. i remember years ago there was a i'm trying i was either i can't remember now if i was reading the interview uh or or listening to it but someone brought up his comics past yeah and it was, and it was a comics related thing it was like a comic-con sort of based interview or something and uh he goes oh yeah i used to work in the, the old Iger studio with all these great guys so like what's will eisner up to how's he, how's he doing and <laughs> i remember crazy. being so excited like he remembers will eisner you know yeah. it's like he has no idea what will eisner did right after right. that he's just right like, he just remembers him from that time yeah that's yeah. so crazy. this is yeah. our second uh outer limits actor that has a cartooning it is, as yeah. well because Robert Culp, also right. a, 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 a yeah. fine amateur cartoonist, and had you know aspirations to to do it professionally. Yeah, and and Land, actually Landau, he when I, when uh, when we moved to to LA and and lived in Studio City, I used to go to the Bookstar all the time. It was a bookstore in on Ventura Boulevard, and I I remember seeing Martin Landau there, and like oh, wow. really early when when we moved here, and like like this is like the first like super exciting, you know, like celebrity sighting for me. And like, you know, and I of course said nothing to him. Later well, yeah. I worked on the, not that much later actually, but I, I later I worked on the, uh, the first X-Files movie and he has a role in there. Mm -hmm. And so I got, you know, I, it was, I got to see him work a little bit, you know, I know I didn't meet him. I didn't try to, you know, but, uh, but like it was also, uh, um, it was on location and it was in a bar. And so, it's hard to get up, you know, it's hard to like be on set and not be in the way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I did get to, to watch him work a little bit and see him like, and he was just such a fucking pro. Like he, you know, the, uh, I remember him asking Rob, the director, what lens they were on and, uh, and then just going, Oh, right. So in here, like just knowing exactly what, you know, how much of him was, you know, was Big in track. the frame based on, you know, uh, the director telling him the lens, you know, I mean, it's just such a kind of like, you know, that's a no bullshit. Like he's a great actor. He's, a, he's like and a, an actor who, you know, you know, who could, who could bring a lot of depth to things, but he was also just this very hyper competent technical actor. I mean, he's compelling. And under all this Andro makeup or whatever, he's putting across a, a, a very connectable character yeah uh, the whole time which is not can't be easy with probably 10 pounds of rubber on your face no yeah no. i mean even more so than last week with david mccallum and six finger i mean he really is buried under there but he's yeah. got those great eyes and and he is a, i mean and then just like those you always hear from these great actors that uh do science fiction and talk about acting through masks and stuff and, and what they're able to do. And, uh, you know, the right actor can really still project himself in, in such a yeah. way. Yeah, and it, but you know what? Often those are people who can go really big in order to, to play it in the makeup. And then sometimes they're not as great when they're, you know, uh, when, Exposed. You know when they're not doing that. You know, sometimes right. they're just, they're big all the time, you know? And, and Landau's doing both things and doing them super well. No, I totally agree. Did Karina... Uh, Karina Becco, of course, uh, I know, worked at the Playboy Mansion, and frankly, Lando was a regular at the Playboy Mansion as well. And I know we had at uh, my sports radio station, we had a Chicago connection with Hef and with Christy Hefner and uh, did several broadcasts at the mansion. And our host got to sit down with Landau and stuff and had a, 
I mean, our, our host is a massive old-time movie fan and TV fan, so really got to have a great conversation with him. And I'm sure you guys know, too, from Turner Classic Movies, that Lando's a great storyteller about his sure. career. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everything. So I don't know if Karina ever had a chance to meet him. I don't him. think that she ever ran into him there. I, I think maybe, you know, in those later days, he wasn't going there. I know he had a young wife and, uh, you know, in, in, uh, you know, towards the end there. So maybe that was, uh, he, he wasn't going and hanging out with Hef. Gotcha. But, yeah, this uh, is 20 years ago when I'm talking, like 99, 2000, around that yeah, time. Yeah. Well, so. yeah. I mean, that's that's probably, I mean, she was there a couple years after that. So. Okay. Um, yeah, his, is, his is one of the best episodes of Marin, if you listen to oh, what. Oh, yeah, that's the, right. Yeah. That was great. And he, yeah, him and him talking about acting is great. And he was a teacher as well. He, yeah. He, he taught acting as well. Uh, yeah, and, that's right. I remember that. Yeah, go back. Everybody listening to this, go back and listen to that episode. It's yeah, great. it's like one of the rare times Mark shuts up and lets him talk, and it's great. Oh, yeah. Um, Anthony Lawrence, the guy who wrote the uh, episode, uh, interesting. He's got not only uh, obvious ties to some classic TV, but he wrote not only Elvis's movie Roustabout, oh. but he also wrote the Kurt Russell TV bio movie of Elvis. Yeah, the one that John Carpenter directed. The, huh. uh, yeah, it, like, I haven't seen that since, I mean, I remember seeing it, like, I don't know, in when I was a kid or something. Great TV, TV movie, guys. Excellent TV movie. Truly great. I remember. Great cast, and, and truly, I think, one of Kurt Russell's uh, great performances, no lie. So. Yeah, and John uh, Carpenter making something that's not a, a, you know, where he's not fitting hold into being a, a horror director. You know? Absolutely. I mean, really, you know. That's, and he also he wrote uh, he wrote one of the '80s Twilight Zone episodes as well. Oh, okay. And Room Two Twenty Two, good relevant early '70s show. Medical Center, Mod Squad, Rat Patrol, several episodes of Rat Patrol. <laughs> Rat Patrol. Oh, Rat Patrol. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. Actually, so if we're talking about him, you know, so uh, yeah, you know, we the you know the rest of the episode is a sort of you know will he or won't he Beauty and the Beast sort of uh, you know will he be able to kill. You know, uh, uh, the biology. What turns out to be, Ka you know, uh, Bertram Cabot Jr.'s uh, father, or or his mother, or whatever. You know, and uh, and, and yeah, he realizes he came too early. Yeah, he assumed he was going to directly kill right Junior, right. and then but, realized, oh no, it's Senior. And, and then he, even worse, that Shirley Knight, who he's yeah, starting that, to fall for. Yeah, that he's fallen in love with the mother of you know the, the, guy, the guy who brings about the apocalypse. But, He's a past actor, by the way. He shows up and bam, they make a connection and you know. yeah. I there, <laughs> but I think that I, I, you know, I mean, I think that in some ways, like while it's not, you know, it's maybe not super credible, particularly when she chases after him after uh, he uh, almost uh, murders her uh, husband to be. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've had to find out more about this guy. In a big, in a kind of big like big broad sort of you know fairy tale ish way i think that it you know they're two you know they're two sort of outsiders you know and they're 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 they think you know they're they both kind of approach things in this kind of you know with this kind of wonder at nature and you know lyricism and stuff i mean it which in the script that I read is even more pronounced. I mean, the all of the fairy tale aspects of it are more pronounced in the script, in a way. The uh, but definitely, she at one point in the script she refers to herself as a uh, as a female Thoreau. Like she, it's really wow. about you know, and and the whole thing with the frog and the yeah, she's holding you know, a little frog, and and frog, just the, frog. the way that I mean, I, and I think that the you know the stuff with the the pool and the wooded area and all that is so kind of fairy tale, yeah, ethereal, Amlin sort of misty, you know. Yeah, uh, well, that's I was gonna say Hall. I mean, Hall is amazing in these like shadow shots like this and yeah. things like that. But I was really amazed by the um, the shots in daylight. That had yeah, that kind and, of misty in well, the wood to stuff, and they, and they, I mean, they're. I think they're, you know, there's literal mist in the background of some of these shots, uh, and you know, and then in others, they just go nuts with the Vaseline on the lens, but uh, yeah. probably because it's impossible to get the fucking mist to stay there, and so you know, it's easier to do the Vaseline. Sure. But, but the, uh, but yeah, all of that stuff and that kind of, you know, and the the little lights and the eyes and everything, and making it feel so. Uh, so 
you know, magical. Uh, it was, is, uh, you know, and, and having, having that kind of contrast between those two things. I mean, everything is better when there are big contrasts, you know, there's yeah. the dark and moody stuff and then there's the, the magical outdoor stuff. Uh, but I like when he meets the landlady and, uh, he uh, hypnotizes two five dollars yes. into her hand, so he has some rent for the week. Yeah, I know, but it's all you know. Like that, that lady just is. She's not getting any money, so she's not. She can't spend <laughs> them. You know, like it's it, that. That's kind of like the jerkiest thing in this. Like the most villainous move in this episode. And John Considine, who plays the uh, groom that unfortunately doesn't get married, but. Uh, I didn't. I mean, I should have seen the resemblance a lot earlier. I've seen him in a million things. You have, yes. Uh, but I didn't realize he was Tim Considine's older brother. Right. And, you know, yeah. Tim Considine, like you know, one of the great Disney actors of the fifties and sixties. Right. He was also on My Three Sons in the. Life. Right. He was Mike. He was yeah. the original oldest yeah. son. Right. In the black and white years. Absolutely, right. man. The yeah. Bud episodes. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. But then Considine. Don, he seemed to go. I think that he's sort of, you know, he seemed to kind of move in the, you know, the hipper LA crowd because he ends up in a bunch of 70s movies and a bunch of Altman movies. Uh, he's, I just recently uh, rewatched California Split, and uh, which is super underrated, great movie about uh, um, uh, two degenerate gamblers, uh, you know, basically just taking each other down, down a terrible road together, uh, but funny. Uh, and uh, he he's in that, and uh, and then I know that I in, in looking it up, I saw that he actually wrote a little you know a little later Altman movie called A Wedding. Uh, oh sure. And, uh, you know, which I don't know if it's any great distinction to write a Robert Altman movie considering he throws it all out, but you know, <laughs> I mean, but still, you know, it's it's interesting though that he was the creative guy who was not you know you know he wasn't just a you know, just a jobbing sort of actor, you know, doing whatever, you know. But even as a senior citizen, yeah, I was still getting great character roles. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah, it's just, yeah. I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I totally know this guy. Because I, I read the cast list before I saw the, the show, and I'm like, oh, Tim Constantine's brother. And I'm like, wait a minute, I see the results, and I'm like, wait a minute, it's that guy. Sure. Yeah, and you and he's, he's literally just one of those guys that you've seen in a billion things, too. TV um, and film, yeah. So, no, but, it was great. And Shirley Knight, my God... Um, again, an actor that I became more and more familiar with in her later years. Mm, and yeah. you forget how lovely she was, not forgive me, but uh, she was. She really was this like great ingenue in this yeah, area actually, one, stuff. Of, one of the things I know her from is the, uh, the, the Rain People, the movie that Francis Coppola directed before The Godfather. Like, uh, she's the lead in that. Her and James Conner are the leads in that movie. The movie doesn't work entirely, but uh, but it's kind of interesting. Huh. Uh, she's she's Helen Hunt's mother in As Good As It Gets. Um, God, I want to go back and I want to make sure was it wasn't she in Sweet Bird of Youth? Um, I'm not sure. I'm looking now. Right now, I'm still in the '80s with I her. I think she had a little part in Picnic. That I, I was sounds right. Through. Yeah, but the uh, like one thing that um, that I thought was. Uh, was kind of interesting uh, as just as far as the, the differences between the script and, and what they ended up finally doing were the, you know, like at the beginning, the astronaut, you know, he, he thinks he's going to like, it, it suggested a little bit more in the episode that he realizes he's going to earth, I guess, because he's trying to radio them and, you know, yeah. and trying to, to get some kind of, you know, landing, ordinance or whatever and uh but in the in the script there's nothing like that at all he's basically just there isn't even a, a dialogue scene uh, with this and, and weirdly for a teleplay a lot of it plays without dialogue uh, yeah. he, uh but he you know he, he he flies in and he lands but he just he full-on thinks that he's uh that he's on an asteroid right he's like and that that was uh you know and there's a you know, the, the another obsession of, of the outer limits is asteroids, right? Like it, there, there, there's a whole thing in the uh, well, they're like planetoids. You know. I mean, yeah. Again, this yeah. is this, uh, and I think I might have made this point in uh, Galaxy Being, but um, there's this great audio interview that Arthur C. Clarke did with Studs Terkel around 1962, a year before this was made, and and he's they're postulating 
what is out there in outer space. And in fact, Clark says, when we get to the other planets of the solar system, if there's an atmosphere on the planets. So right. there really are these, you know, bodies like planetoids and asteroids that are out there that I'm sure we've seen by telescope. And they are kind of imagined as almost islands in the sky. Right. You know, so. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, but also like the, so the, in talking about how much more of a fairy tale it sort of is in the script, he, he's described in the script as having golden, uh, have, being covered in hair, having golden eyes and, a, and black nostrils, right? Andro, yeah. Andro. He's, yeah, he's actually Andra in the script. And mm -hmm. for some reason got changed to Andro. I guess that that just sounds more masculine. I don't know. Exactly. But the, um, but like he, uh, and like, as they describe it, 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 he basically, he's the, the, uh, the writer is describing him basically as a lion man, right? Mm -hmm. Like literally he's supposed to kind of look like a lion. And then in the, uh, then later when she sees him that first time in his or original form, like the first time she sees him in the woods there, uh, she later, and she later recalls that to, Martin Landau version of him, uh, she's saying, oh, I saw a lion in the, uh, there. There must be something wrong with me. I saw a lion in the woods. Right. And it's so like uh, he was getting pretty artsy there. Yeah, I know. Like <laughs> it's it's 100 percent. You know, we're we're in uh, Beauty the Cocteau, Beauty and the Beast shit. Right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And uh, and I and I think and just the way that things are described and, and the even more kind of over the top lyrical dialogue in the script, you know, even more than what we get in here, which I also think is fucking great. I love this kind of, you know, heightened thing that uh, that the dialogue does in in a lot of these episodes, but particularly in this one. Yeah, they go, they go meaningful right off the bat. No one's wasting time with small talk. And uh, everybody's talking in this very like a not a naturalistic way, right? Yeah, yeah. No one is no one is expressing themselves in in you know in a terse or naturalistic way, but it's also awesome. But the and, script also didn't have those handoffs in it. The the you know the stuff where when the uh, when the landlady is leading him upstairs and and he's behind her in the makeup and then. We, you know, uh, we pan off him, and then Martin Landau walks into frame, or, yeah. or the the thing where uh, where you uh, tilt down from Martin Landau's face to the hand reaching around, and the hand is the uh, you know, the gloved one. Yeah. All that stuff was great, and it sold everything so well. You know, like it's, it, I just thought that was all super smart, inventive stuff that wasn't yeah. even true. I love I love it because they didn't have to do any cuts. They just like someone else can wear the suit for a yeah. minute. Yeah, the yeah, it's through just, and yeah, right. All those shots were in one. They're not effects. They're just yeah. uh, they're just fake outs, which is great. That's movie making. You know? And then when he runs in, forgets to do the wavy thing that across the 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 screen or whatever, yeah. and everybody sees him like he is. Right. But then, then actually, we get to an interesting thing where suddenly she can't see him as his mutated self anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I I think the, so after the wedding, you mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, in in the script, it describes that as he you know he gets knocked unconscious by the people at the wedding, and so he's not able to keep up the illusion anymore. Right. And then when and then afterwards, it kind of justifies her not uh, you know her following him by saying, "Oh no, she didn't she didn't see him that way." Like not. Not in a sort of mystical or sentimental way, but in a well, like she was literally looking the other direction or something. And it feels very like unconvincing. But I think that the way that the the way the show handled it actually it, it, handling it in a somewhat vaguer way. It, yeah, it's, an, it's a more it's an emotional appeal yeah. instead of a intellectual one. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's not worried about justifying the sciencey bullshit of it. It's it's you know it's it's hooked in there with the character. Should we? I mean, I really want to talk about the ending because I found that incredibly existential. Uh, not yeah, just yeah. him. I mean, I, I understand in any any science fiction fan or even comic book fan, he has changed. He has changed history, taking her away. Right. So we'll, we'll walk everybody through that part. Uh, she comes out and decides, based on him really trying to stop that wedding, 
they really should take out that part where they say if anyone here has any objections to this one. <laughs> because that's just always asking for trouble. And then she runs off with him. They go back to whatever this Eden in the woods is that they keep going to. Where his spaceship, where well, the astronaut spaceship is. And and at this point, the guys are showing up, and they got rifles, man. Yeah, They're, it's like, it's very Frankenstein, the villagers yeah. attacking and then deciding but, whatever this but is. But shooting, even though she's with him. Yes, I know. Like, he, he really turned around on that because they're, like, right next to each other, and he just takes a shot at them. <laughs> uh, but, the, but, like, but one thing about that, the scene, scene right before that, the kind of longer dialogue scene where he, he kind of hypnotizes her into seeing into the, you know, into the future and stuff, there's also a moment in there where he's considering killing her because he, he knows that that could be something that could stop all of this, right? I mean, right. and uh, and that's that's a pretty stark place to go. Probably if it were me, I would have had him kill her because it would be the worst thing you could imagine, right? And, but like, uh, but I think that they're nicer people and they, they did a better, they had a better idea. They wanted to stay on the air. Yeah. They wanted to, do it. <laughs> they wanted to not be pulled off by every station. <laughs> But anyway, but it would have been tough. Noise that would have been a tough, down, you, know. you know, tough way to go in all this. <laughs> so they get there. They get they get to the spaceship just in time. Has a nice little quiet ladder that comes down, and, <laughs> and they get up. And that poor what Constantine's out there, just like what? It's like yeah, the, exactly. ul the ultimate getting left at the altar is yeah. is your fiance running into a spaceship and blasting off the planet. And with an that, ugly alien. That and with a beautiful crane shot that moves around him, yeah. booms up to the other side of his face just in time to see a little tear come out. It's the yeah. best fucking thing. They use the crane like at least twice in this. That and that that chase through the uh, through the woods is fucking amazing. Yes, they're like. There's handheld shots. There, we're running through shit with people. There's trees whipping past in the foreground. They use, they do all sorts of awesome shit. And actually, this chase wasn't even in the in the script. The, the it ended with you know they basically just go off into the woods. They get into the ship and they leave. You know there there isn't that kind of you know. I mean, I think the addition of that chase and the guns and the, all that is really good. You know, and watch him watching them leave. Yeah, I mean, it gets all the tension you need and everything and. Again, the ultimate, wow, I am never getting over this. She left me for a mutant guy in a spaceship and left the planet to be away from me. So they go back out, and then now they're they're making the passage again, that beautiful shot of the spaceship, and then they come to the time rip. Okay, go ahead, John. No, no, uh, that's fine. I mean, you can take it. It was, yeah, all of a sudden, Andrew is feeling those same time convulsions. He realizes... Again, he is the man who's never been born because they have changed history with her going away. Although he never, he doesn't turn back into ugly Andro. He vanishes no. as Martin Landa, which is kind of a, uh, an interesting choice. Don't yeah. you? Yeah, I, and it, I mean, again, it's her perception of him. Yeah. So, yeah. so regardless, I mean, yeah, she sees him. She sees his true self or whatever. Right. But then he fades away. She's left in the cockpit, and I love. Just that all of a sudden, the way they shoot at the ending, the cockpit is exposed to outer space. And again, it's very allegorical. Well, they make it like a stage show instead. Yeah. They yeah. pull back. Because originally, if you go back and look at the beginning, they've got a very figured out cockpit. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah, it's the, you know, but yeah. And now it's just two chairs. Yeah, and her so weeping. It's literally alone. like something you would do on stage. And yes. Pull back. yes. Yeah. Uh, so... They're all, I mean, and 100%, this is like this existential ending. I mean, the, you would assume that things got fixed because of this. But essentially, the story is over because their story is over. Yeah. Um, but, the, uh, but the script, and according to, uh, I think the guy's name is uh, Gary Girani, who did a, an audio commentary for this episode. According to him, they actually shot this final scene. Uh, there, there wasn't a, a, a scene after this. Where uh, and it is in the script where she uh, she wakes up in that little meadow area as if oh it's it was all a dream or something like that and then she runs down the hill and you know presumably you know we Spielberg it up over the hill to uh, to reveal um, that uh, you see. 
the obelisk where, uh, you know, where he had come from at the beginning, you know, uh, it's, it's at least in the script, it's set up as if that place with all the books and stuff was a big obelisk building. Yeah. And the, um, and so she sees that and sees the uh, the world that we saw we saw set up at the beginning, except it's now a lot of and nice place, right? Do they make uh, references I mean, to other humans looking humanoid, or I, well, so the in the version of the script that I read, there were no other people in that scene. But what the what the guy described in the commentary, uh, apparently there was there was some sort of interaction with a regular looking person, which would have made sense. I think that's just, that would be, a, if you're going to do this, you should at least prove that people didn't turn into Andros, right? Sure. sure. But, um, but like, uh, so at the end of this episode, there's actually a credit for an actor who isn't in this, right? Oh. He's, he's the guy in the final oh. scene. They just, end, I guess they just ended up cutting the final huh. scene so late that, you know, or he was just contractually, you know, they, they had to give him the credit even if they cut the scene. Because they realize the heart of the story is not whether they saved humanity. Yes. It, yeah. it, that she lost Andra. Yes, exactly. it's a tragedy. It's yeah. funny that I, I, it didn't even occur to me to go look and see like how this might have other played out. I was thinking as soon as I got done, like, oh, if they did it now, somebody would go with, especially the Spielberg period of we must button everything up. She would land there, and then she would meet Andro as he looks not mutated right, right. and yeah. they would still make a connection and you would know that they're going to get together right as he welcomes yeah. her to the and, planet and that's and how the, the cons the real world consequences of that would be we would not be doing this podcast right now because i would right. find that just kind of this sucks <laughs> and you know and it would be a completely different kind of show yeah no oh, we'd be we'd be on our uh our uh, Bernard Herman uh, podcast. Yeah, the Bernard Herman no, podcast. Yeah. Perhaps we, the podcast about uh, John Cassavetti's Johnny Staccato TV show. Uh, I have that box set, sir. I love hey. that TV show. Yeah, me too. <laughs> That's a I think great actually, TV well, show. I think Landau was in an episode of it, and um, uh, Shirley Knight was in an episode. I believe so, it. Uh, yes, oh. I saw I, I believe that's a follow-up series at some point. Yeah. If only there were a Cassavetti's Outer Limits episode. Oh, my God. Yeah, that would be fantastic. If only. Just, if only. He probably would have just been too mean to them and, uh, you know, yeah. fired. God, uh, I, this boy, this is one of my favorite Columbus. Columbus. Staccato, I love that show. I really do. They showed it on, I believe, the Trio Network. I don't know if you guys remember Trio yeah. in the early 2000s. Yeah, I think and, I know it mostly as the little icon at the bottom of YouTube videos where, that people have, you know, have ripped from <laughs> Trio channel. They they showed um, the Look Well pilot with Adam West that uh, Rob Smigel and Conan O'Brien created. Oh, for, yeah. Uh, I, think, yeah. I, I, I watched that pretty recently. That's actually pretty. It's very yeah, funny. Really it's a shame. <laughs> it's and, and that's the thing. Um, Trio would show these uh, pilots and also short-lived television shows under the umbrella title of Brilliant But but Cancelled. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of great stuff in there in that they showed like that. Um, and also, I remember uh, they would show Letterman reruns from the 80s from the NBC show. Right. Well, this is probably where I'm getting the thing about Trio because I, I spend an inordinate amount of time watching old Letterman episodes uh, while, while I'm working and stuff, or when uh, I'm feeling very, very depressed. And I remember marathons of my favorite throwaway reality show, The Battle of the Network Stars. Oh, sure. Right. Which yeah. is such a great show, you know. Yeah. So but where, where, you go, where you go to watch a 50-yard dash between Robert Conrad and Gabe Kaplan and walking back yeah. home. Yeah. And Gabe Although Kaplan I, walks him. <laughs> I think that that celebrity so bowling show is better though. That's super I love that low rent celebrity bowling show that like you know, uh, there's one of them with like the Brady kids on it, and they're like, we think we're coming back for another year, but we're not sure. You know, oh, I forgot they said that at the end of that one. Yeah, That's yeah. great. I, I there's a couple episodes where Roy Rogers is bowling, and he is like a 200 handicap bowler. He's a great bowler. It's amazing. It's yeah. like wow, look at Roy go, man. No horse or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that. Oh, so, oh, yeah. The the other thing about it in this episode, the landlady, uh, who Maxine yes. Stewart, she's she's in that Twilight Zone episode, The Eye of the Beholder. She's the voice of the lady throughout with the when she has the bandages on throughout oh. the whole Eye wow. of the Beholder episode, right? Really? But who, who's uh, unbandaged to be Donna Douglas? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, 
So huh. uh, that's amazing. That, I didn't know that. That's, that's the incredible. Twilight Zone connection. Well, and again, uh-huh. that's um, you know, like I said, Land- I love that Landau really did embrace a lot of science, and certainly Space Nineteen Ninety Nine, but did several episodes of Twilight Zone, and and really during and, his wilderness period before Ed Wood, where people rediscovered how great he was, and suddenly he was getting A list parts. You know, I mean, as we all know, he was in uh, the Harlem Globetrotters on Gilligan's Island. I can't believe you brought this up before I did, but yes, that's true. Um, but like uh, the. But also, well, yeah, but I mean, he was also in the, that Coppola movie, Tucker, and then, you know, he... Yes, uh, well, he was nominated. That, that, Wasn't that, he nominated for Tucker for... Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, you yeah, that kind of got him going. But also the, uh, you know, not supposed to talk about it, but Woody Allen, uh, Crimes and Misdemeanors. Crimes and Misdemeanors. He's fucking so amazing good. movie. And he's yeah. so good in that movie. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, um, but he made a TV movie that was a bit like Groundhog Day with Jonathan Silverman, and it was called like 1201, and it was about a repeating day, hmm. and he was the scientist in that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, again, yeah, he would just, uh, would I think, was very fond of science fiction and not afraid of, you know, whatever, typecasting or whatever. Yeah, you know. I mean, he clearly was, you know, interested in the work and interest and saw, didn't, you know, didn't just look down on this stuff, you know? I mean, I... Uh, the, I just listened to the audiobook from this guy, um, uh, Paul Hirsch, who's an editor. And he edited, he won an Oscar for editing Star Wars, right? Uh, the first Star Wars. And, uh, you know, and it, it's interesting him going through his career, but he's, he's also just like, anytime any genre type thing comes up, he's like, well, this is garbage. I'm not, I'm not doing this. This has a zombie in it garbage you know like i and you know and there's certainly and i've often run into this kind of you know i mean at least before particularly before the the modern era where everything is some very narrow genre thing like just where people are very dismissive of genre stuff and i'm sure that was even more so the case back then but you know he seemed he certainly seemed to embrace whatever was a good part yeah oh man him as uh, going back to a john him as lugosi that's just such a sweet role. It's fantastic. It's, I mean, it's also one of my favorite movies ever. You know, I mean, I and like, uh, and an endlessly watchable movie. Yeah. And, you know, also eccentric casting. He looks nothing like Bela Lugosi, right? <laughs> but he, you know, but like he just, he just managed to make that part his own, like in a ridiculous sort of way. I mean, like, you know, I mean, and totally subverts the idea that it's, you know, that it's about, you know, that it's the kind of wizard magazine casting of, uh, hey, this wrestler looks like this <laughs> this character. Right. right. George the Animal Steel, I believe. Yeah. George Johnson, absolutely. Yes, Who absolutely. probably did look more like Bela Lugosi than Martin Landau did. But, it, but I mean, <laughs> yeah. I think that, uh, you know, he just does it, though. He just pulls but it also, off. physically, you could see him being a, literally a starving actor uh, and also a junkie, given his physique and everything. I kind of always... I thought he looked really emaciated as as Lugosi in yeah. in, uh, in Ed yeah. Wood, and it worked. Um, yeah, yeah. But also, again, after Ed Wood, good Lord, he really had a great uh, second act as far as his career, or third act. Yeah. And then really, like, worked until his last days. And I can't remember, he was in a police procedural where he was um, uh, a medical examiner for the police. Hmm. Hmm. And I can't remember the name of the show, but it was great. And it was one of those good ensemble kind of attempts at a show, but he was fantastic in it. And uh, and yeah, I mean, really great. I just yeah, we uh, didn't we didn't even mention Mission Impossible. Yeah, or well, of uh, course Space, Roland Hand or Space nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, uh, but as far it's as the most implausible sci fi concept oh my God. of any show possible, that show is like I think every several years of my life i go well maybe that's a good show maybe i should try to watch it again you know you and remember all oh, the moon what the is fuck is the, the what you know like i mean the scripts are ludicrous yeah. and not but, in a good way they're they, they're, they're a paint dry level of ludicrous but you know? the designs in the show are so 70s sci-fi it is like watching a ton of sci-fi paperback novels just come to life and walk. No, around. it's actually more like just watching them sit on the shelf. Yeah, it is glacially, it, glacially it, it slow. Is so slow and so not 
going anywhere. But, but I love yeah. I love Jerry Anderson's designs. Yeah, I love yeah. his yeah. miniatures. Well, that, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry to every Space 1999 person. I'm sure. You, know, I, I'm sure well, I'm you, get, you get to see a bunch of cool British actors come through, like Brian There's, Blessed turns yeah. up as an alien. Or, right. You can't or, go wrong with uh, – speaking of big – Speaking of yeah. giving big performances, exactly. We must be people. very quiet right now. <laughs> All right, Mr. Blessed. No problem. <laughs> yeah, you just have to deal with the fact that the premise is the moon is hurtling through space. And, <laughs> because there's pass- a chain reaction of all the nuclear waste that's been stored on the moon. And, and passing lots of inhabited planets along the way. And yeah, they- that's the problem. And they yeah. crash one of those eagle landers every week. Yeah, you know what? You're right. I'm going to go back and give Space 1999 another You shot. know what's crazy? <laughs> uh, the two of the free streaming channels that, uh, you you know, if, if you have Roku or Apple TV or Google or whatever, um, Pluto and Stir both okay. have, or at least um, have at separate times, had Space 1999 channels where they just constantly play the, the two seasons of Space 1999. And that second season of Space 1999 is even more screwed up by the same man who screwed up the last season of Star Trek. Yeah, that's right. Fred yeah. Freiberg. Yeah. Freiberger, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. Ooh. Landau. And it's yeah. interesting hearing Landau and Barbara Bain talk about working with uh, Jerry and Sylvia Anderson, the producers of Space 1999, and uh, yeah, those were two camps of couples that did not get along and oh, saw yeah. things very differently from day one, and that's why the show is the mess that it is. Hmm. Like, well, why aren't they just floating here like this at the end, like supercar or something like that? Supercar or yeah, Joe right. uh, Joe right. One Ninety or whatever the hell it was called. Yeah, <laughs> Joe Ninety. All those shows. They Joe probably 90, showed, up, showed up assuming that they would only be playing the human hands for the inserts. You know? <laughs> Yeah, and we didn't even we didn't really even talk about him as Leonard in North by Northwest. It's just one of my favorite uh, henchman roles ever. Yeah, well, he just come. I mean, the way that just as an actor, the way that he connects on screen, like he can, you know, he can play this this little role in this thing, and and you remember him as one of the leads from the movie. You know, I mean, yes, so good at it. Those eyes. It's those it's those magnetic eyes. Seriously, you can't you can't look away. And yeah. I love and also I love the implied homosexual re- relationship yeah. between yeah and James and Mason and the thing. I mean, it's supposedly like Hitchcock saw uh, Landau on stage in some part that where he was playing a gay character and the and thought, oh well, and you know basically just offered him the part and said, well, you know, you do such a great job with this this part on stage. It's, this is just this little trifle of a thing but you know no but presumably knowing that he could really bring something to it yeah but it did it did make it a more interesting thing instead of your uh your Full goon figure for james mason like a uh oh wait what what's your favorite character name gabe uh uh sugar, sugar small house yeah sugar small house classic <laughs> goon yeah um, what's that from Sugar Small House is from Kiss Me Deadly. I feel like oh, it's fantastic. every other every every other podcast we do together, I'm I'm trying I, I try to get you to watch Kiss Me Deadly. It's like, <laughs> That's kind of true, actually. Oh, good. The, All right, but uh, before before we do scene missing, the next scene missing we do, I'll try and watch Kiss Me Deadly. Look, I yeah. although honestly, I feel like Bertram Cabot Jr. is a name that is almost on par with Sugar Small House. Like I just want to Bertram Cabot Jr. is one of those names I just want to say all the time. You know, it feels yeah. it, there's just a, there's there's a sort of musical a a kind of harsh, perhaps German musicality to uh, uh, to to that name that that somehow just you know. And Landau keeps even almost singing it, Bertram Cabot Jr. <laughs> it's it to me could have been the alternate uh, name of the millionaire as opposed to John Barrettsford Tipton. It could have been Bertram <laughs> Cabot Jr. Hello, Mike. Who am I giving a million dollars to this week? Yeah. Well, sir, it's Bertram Cabot Jr. <laughs> he will destroy the world with it. <laughs> I hope he doesn't use the million dollars for evil purposes. And, I, and it makes me think of how many times when I'm writing a, a, a character who's just going to be a, like a walk-on on a scene or something, 
And it's like, oh, I don't want to give them too good a name. I need that name. It's like names are hard. I want to. It's like, man, they they literally took one of their best names and put it on a character you never see. Yeah, well, I just, I just. But he's important in yeah. that in that Orson Welles way. Yeah. That I remember, he said he was in a play, Mr. Where Wu. He's Mr. Wu, yeah. and and the first act, everyone is talking about Mr. Wu, and Mr. Wu literally makes his first appearance. At the curtain, at the end of uh, at the end of Act One, and the curtain comes down. So and then, know, and then the story thing. goes that the that the audience, you know, then you know, uh, at the intermission, they're talking. Oh, isn't that actor who played Mr. Wu wonderful? You know, he had no lines. He wasn't in the thing. It was just that people were talking about him all the time. So they got across that idea. But that's, I mean, that's Harry Lime as well. Yeah. Oh, yes, it's, it's very uh, much so. It's the about audience stuff. gasps when he walks out. Yeah, and and you know. Uh, you know, Bertram Cabot Jr. is all build up. He isn't in the show. He doesn't even exist. He's not like he he was he's he was never even conceived because of what happened in the show. It's great, you know. But he's the yeah. MacGuffin. He is, oh, that he is a human MacGuffin, basically. That reminds me to get back to the disappearance of Reardon, yeah. uh, the cool astronaut. He also didn't exist. Well, I mean, like once if you if if you're going by the the time paradox thing or whatever, once uh, Andro comes back and changes the past, then the whole thing never needed to happen. You know, the, uh, you know, it's so. Yeah. Right. So the, I actually, suppose, I mean, it's but, kind of, yeah, it's kind of hinky the way, I mean, it doesn't necessarily negate his existence per se. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, if it if it's not him there. being there at all, that would make sense. But it, but at the same time, if it was negating him being there at all, why does Martin Landau even have to go back and do anything in the episode? So I, I, mean, I need yeah. much more marijuana to ponder. I'm not sure. Said, said yeah. question. I have. But to say. that said, I also don't care. I mean, I th I can I think <laughs> you can totally make that argument, you know, uh, and it's fine. I mean, I think it was fine because I think that it just is in service of mm. this. Yeah, you know, story that's about something else. You as know? long as it's entertaining, then it worked. It's yeah, entertaining. It it's resonant. It's emotional. It had the the whole thing about you know. I mean, tying together a time travel thing with a parentage type thing is such a classic, you know, yeah. time travel conundrum. But yes. and I think that the way that they do it here, it works really well. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and, we're at an hour, gentlemen. We uh, is there anything else to say about this episode? Otherwise, I'm. Going to go into uh, more tangents. It's and, an Alzheimer. You you it, should definitely watch it if you're. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. If you're trying to figure out what are the best Outer Limits episodes are. You yeah, just be wrong. beautifully shot once again, Gabe Sero, Conrad Hall. And you know this is this is why I want to be you know this episode this kind of episode is why I want to be doing a show about this you know why it's worth talking about this why I'm sort of obsessed with the show for a really long time because well, and, 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 and you, because it's not because people don't talk about the outer limits really you know well and as you said too Gabe that this is your classic example of gothic romance yeah outer limits yeah yeah you know which which really and again in a, and yet and yet still very sci-fi yeah and it's and it it really it, it proves your point that yeah this is an overlooked show and it and it's it's an it's an also read it's it's joe frazier to the twilight zones muhammad ali you'll forgive the boxing analogy but yeah i mean it's it's an also ran unless you really sit down and really pay attention to it well it's i mean you know the the most obscure thing something that never aired and you get to see can be the most brilliant thing ever it doesn't matter how popular it is it's it's about the quality of the thing and so you know it's it's just worth spending time talking about this i mean you know you're saying you're going to do a star trek show and it's like on one hand i'm like oh that's that's cool i love talking about star trek on the other hand everybody yeah. knows about star trek and well traveled well, territory at absolutely. Item, right so like absolutely. i just most I, I just feel like it's it's worth doing this because it's worth talking about a thing that you know everybody hasn't spent a lot of time talking about I yeah you can and it can be a companion piece to your whatever your favorite Columbo show is because again they, everybody who was on I Columbo <laughs> who was any good is also on the outer limits you know like it's very and, and like for Twilight Zone the obvious comparison like you guys were saying last week when people always bring up the Twilight Zone it it's kind of funny when you think of the way Serling would often talk about yeah we could take on these big subjects because we were doing it in the guise of 
you know, like, oh, this is science fiction, blah, blah, blah. And The Outer Limits certainly does that, too. Interesting, there's no, it doesn't devolve into Night Gallery or anything later. You know, you don't get a whatever <laughs> version, 70s version of Outer Limits. Right, right. No, yeah, you got, Paul Williams. Yeah. You've got the 90s Outer Limits that, again, for a 90s show... I thought it was a very successful. We're going to see, John. The jury is out because no, because you're the only person who's watched it. So, like, <laughs> we'll see. In in John's uh, alternate timeline, that show did really well, and it was on, and he saw it, and I never saw it. I don't. Yeah, yeah if, I mean, if more I, of I, you see it, maybe I'll fade out. That maybe isn't a good I, idea. Though. I was. I mean, it certainly was something I, I was aware of. And actually, this week I I went and looked up to see what episode because we were kind of talking about if the the episodes they had remade, and I think it's only like two, three of them or something: Nightmare, iRobot, and uh, Feasibility Study. Uh, and uh, so it, I don't know if it's you know maybe if I, I doubt that we will make it to the point where we're watching uh, uh, you know we're going through the '90s outer limits. But when we get to the episodes that they remake, it'll probably be worth taking a look at those as well. And you know, and, and they just, are on Amazon Prime. And yeah. I and honestly, the I'll tell you um, as someone said about uh, thinking that the, they remade the Six Finger as the Richard Thomas episode. That is a good episode, and also. Um, the, the pilot for it uh, called Sand Kings, and I don't know if that was a famous so, uh, science fiction short story or not. It was, it was the George R. R. Martin short story. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh right. And, and was, uh, Bridges. Was, I, I first saw it, I think I read it in Omni. Mm. Oh, wow. Omni. And I remember re being really impressed with it. Um, can I do my Bob Guccione? In the latest Omni, you'll read about alien invasions, possible <laughs> space exploration. I used to love, he would do the commercials. Bob Guccione Sr., the wow. man of uh, Penthouse. Really? Okay. Okay. It, it, that was his magazine. I got to interview well, I Bob. Yeah. I got to interview Bob Jr. when he was doing Gear magazine, and uh, for my sports radio station. And I'm like, and I didn't know that there was uh, a wedge between Junior and Senior. But I'm like, dude, I loved your father. And he started laughing. He's like, oh, Penthouse. I'm like, no, Omni. And I go, and those commercials. They're like, your father <laughs> had the greatest radio voice ever. In the latest Omni. I mean. I love really that creepy. magazine so much. It was, it's like, oh, a car of the future. I was just totally into it. Oh, oh, that, Bo Bridges, Bo Bridges is in Sand Kings, and again, it was a really effective '90s made science fiction TV movie. Okay. So, all right. Well, we'll see. In you yeah, know, we'll see. forty something weeks from now, we will decide whether or not to. Uh, we wait, got forty. What, what's we the got forty-three weeks again? to go? I know. <laughs> what's that? What, what's the episode writer's name again? Oh, of this, oh. Uh, it's uh, Anthony, Anthony Lawrence. Yeah, Anthony Lawrence. Yeah, and and, and I, I did remember he wrote another episode of The Outer Limits. It's in this season. He it's did write another one. Yeah, uh, Spider and, uh, Children of Spider oh, County. Children of Spider County. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, one, another one of the the bear. It's one of the ones everybody thinks of when they think of yes. Outer Limits. Right. And, and like, what was the director's name on this? I, I was going to say uh, Leonard Horn. Leonard Horn, right? And he, he I believe he directed Xanti Misfits. Uh, one oh. of the other awesome episodes later. Oh, wow. And that's coming up, absolutely. Yeah. And, a, and a ton of television. Yeah. From, like, sitcoms to Dr. Kildare and The Defenders. It Takes a Thief, Several Voyage to the Bottoms of the Sea, Mission Impossible, Ironside. Yeah. You know, and all the way to the Wonder Woman. At uh -huh. least according to the yeah he did the pilot for Wonder Woman that's right and according to the the Outer Limits book apparently he was uh, he was pretty um, like he was he was a pretty visual guy and a pretty like you know uh, pretty sophisticated director you know and mm -hmm. so him and Conrad Hall working together to you know to to make this thing I, I think was was a big reason why it was so successful yeah that's excellent I guess should we do a shout out uh, in honor of Diana Rigg John since. Uh, yeah, I was hoping actually. Yeah, it's a sad day. Uh, Has nothing to do with this, but you know. But no, but for for cinephiles and and television fans, no. Uh, Dame Diana Rigg was uh, an incredible actor, and uh, what a, what an amazing career. And I mean, from a young ingenue to right up till the end when she was doing Downton Abbey and and the like. Yeah. And she's in the best Bond movie. Honor yeah. Majesty's Secret Service, Tracy <laughs> Bond. We have all the time in the world, but sadly we don't. She was also uh, one of her last roles. I, well, no, she was working right up to the end, but she briefly uh, would appear on the British show The Detectorists. 
mm. which is a, a favorite of mine. I don't know. Uh, it's uh, Mackenzie Crook. Um, oh yeah, yeah, and uh, but uh, she's playing the mom of of his wife, who's her real daughter, and uh, oh, is, wow. is also a great actress. She's really funny. Um, so if you yeah, if you get a chance, if you want to, if you get stressed out and want to watch something very relaxing and not like American TV in the least, it's uh, Detectress. All right, good to know. Is that on? Is that on BritBox? Where? What is it? Detectress on? I believe it's on Amazon. It's either on Amazon or Netflix. I forget okay. which one. All right. Very cool. Seems like Amazon though. All right. But very, very, good. very good. All right, yeah. gentlemen. Well. Done. Okay. Well, so next week we're going to be uh, we're we're looking at Obit. O b i t. Okay. Very excited for Obit. Yes. It's another interesting episode. Jeff Corey stars in it, and the uh, blacklisted uh, Jeff Corey. Yes, yeah. Did. Yeah. The famous acting teacher, method acting teacher Jeff Corey, and also uh, also a huge uh, sci fi veteran of many roles. Yeah, from yeah. from this to Star Trek to Babylon Five, even. Okay. So, yeah. 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 And uh, you know, it, it's another interesting one. So, uh, and I I believe I have the script for that one as well. So I will uh, spend too much time talking about that. Where are you getting all these scripts? Uh, I don't have. I don't only have a couple of them, but like I, I've you know, I just kind of picked them up along the way. I know I got this, the, that place on Hollywood that used to be there. That Eddie sold out. yeah, I mean that. I I think I actually got the one for this episode from Creature Feature uh, that was uh, in Burbank. You know, oh, okay. they're there anymore, but they've on and off been in Burbank for the last last thirty years or whatever. Mm -hmm. That guy Taylor White. Runs it. I think. I'm so glad I was there in the early '80s and saw all those mom and pop shops where they would have scripts of, of TV. Oh shows. well, those, but those were. I mean, at least what's it called was uh, on Hollywood Boulevard was still there until. I mean, I maybe it's still there. I don't know. I don't leave the house. Yeah, it was just like a little hole in the wall, just lined with screenplay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And posters and whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Oh, and right. I, and, I, and, I, and very quickly mentioning that. Uh, I learned that uh, Polly Platt, one of her first jobs when she came to L.A. from New York with Bogdanovich, was transcribing scripts. Oh, uh, really? Know, classic yeah. scripts to, to sell and everything at these little shops and everything. No, oh, I didn't hear about that. Yeah. yeah. Was, huh. Although that podcast was super interesting about... Uh, you must remember this. Yes, can't, can't recommend it enough. Uh, really good. Great old Hollywood uh, podcast, Katrina Longworth, the host and writer of the show. And, um, and and this this season of it about Polly Platt was by far I think the best of of the show. Certainly and, one of them, absolutely. Like, you know, and totally, you know, uh, it, it's it's doing something over and above just you know talking about uh, things that you know we maybe sort of know about. I mean, it's really diving in and bringing new information and working off of her memoir, unpublished memoirs and stuff. So it's it absolutely worth worth. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, any of the kind of stuff we talk about. Usually. What's that, Jeff? It really does the homework from what I've what little I've listened to it. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. But, yeah, no, but this new this new season's really worth uh, really worth checking out. I completely agree. And an interesting contrast uh, to TCM's Bogdanovich uh, podcast that he and Ben Mankiewicz are doing. Yeah, exactly. They, because that is uh, you know uh, the the fictional delusion world of uh, Peter Bogdanovich. And uh, the the other one is the like harsh reality, a, a and more interesting, grounded reality thing. You know uh, that doesn't have as many Orson Welles impressions in it, but is uh, entertaining nonetheless. What are you going to do? Um, and also, this very uh, podcast and YouTube show is now an audio podcast as well. It's to the outer limits, uh, and it is available on the Spreaker Network. I've seen the first. I, I put up all of our first five episodes uh, during uh, the holiday weekend. I have only seen the two of them appear so far in the feed. So uh, when when it is really up and running, I will share it on social media. I'm sure Gabe will as well and Jeff. Uh, so uh, look look for the audio version should you miss an episode of To the Honor Limits. I will certainly be posting this audio in that feed uh, tomorrow. But in the meantime, we will return uh, the ability to control your, uh, your podcast and your uh, video uh, to you. And we ask you to join us next week when we take control again and take you to the outer limits. Thank you, uh, Gabe. Thank you, Jeff. Good talk as always. <laughs> Everybody take care. And as 